All right, so we'll get started. And, um, you know, it's kind of not the most exciting topic because I'm not going to be talking about specific pests or how to control them. I'm really going to mention these kinds of products that some of you may be using day to day and aren't as familiar with, um, or in terms of you're not familiar with what they're made of. And um, just so you know, the focus is strictly, um, all the products I'm going to mention are for organic application, um, primarily. So we're not really mentioning any conventional products, but the topic is biopesticides. And so I'll just give a little brief intro to biopesticides and then some examples of those that are made into insecticides and those that are fungicides. So in general, what we call a biopesticide, it's a product that is made from naturally occurring materials like animals, plants, bacteria, or minerals. And a biopesticide, of course, targets pests. And it can be anything from a weed to insect to plant pathogen. Now, for those of you that um, you know, keep an eye on the stock market, you might want to look at biopesticide companies because it really is a growing and thriving business. Um, just here, you see in this graphic from 2019 to 2026, it's estimated to increase by more than a billion um, in the market share. So, you know, keep an eye on those on the biopesticides. So it is one that's growing. Um, a lot more scientists are looking for ways to make new biopesticides. There's a lot more coming on the market. And scientists are not really looking at new conventional um, pesticides, which is unfortunate. But just note that there's more of these biopesticides coming about. So what scientists do is they look for all kinds of um, natural products that could be used to target pests. And one way that where they get a lot of these is from the soil. So if you think about a little bitty gram of soil can contain about a billion microorganisms and that could be represented by about 10,000 different species. So they take these microorganisms and test them against um, a, a pest. And in this case, these pictures I'm gonna show you is against a plant pathogen. So the picture on the left is the actual pathogen growing on its own in an artificial media. And then the picture on the right has the pathogen plus the particular uh, organism they're testing against the pathogen. So you'll be able to see that on the right, the pathogen is not able to grow at all near that beneficial or targeted testing organism. And so um, this is like kind of the start of how they test these different products is testing them in artificial means. So again, there's a lot of them they're looking at and a lot of testing that has to be done. So many that are already available on the market though, um, and some of these names I'll mention, some of you might be familiar with, um, but you know, you think about these organisms that are in our lives day to day, and we're actually using them um, so that we can grow our vegetables. So currently there's about 1500 different products that are registered. And a lot of them have, are the same pro uh, using the same active ingredient. So there's about 400 different active ingredients that could, could be considered these bio uh, pesticides. So most of the active ingredients shown 58% are biochemical. So what that means, it's made from like a plant extract. Um, it's a fatty based acid or some kind of extract. And then the rest are microbial. So like fungi, plants, um, bacteria, and then others. So the biopesticides, they don't necessarily work like our, the conventional products, which can kind of kill the, the target organism right away. The biopesticide could work by competing with the organism and making it not even being able to grow or live. It can release toxins that would kill the target organism over time. 
um, it can consume the uh, target organism directly. And then finally, some of these can actually stimulate the plants to have uh, a better defense system. And so when the pest uh, attacks it, it's able to fight it off better. So there's a lot of benefits to using um, biopesticides. You know, they're, they're less toxic than conventional uh, pesticides. So we have that worker safety. There's little, if any, um, residue to have to worry about with food safety, like um, with the vegetables, usually they can be consumed almost on the same day uh, as the application. They usually target a specific pest or group of pests. And so what that means is then there's less of an impact on other organisms like our beneficial insects, pollinators, humans. And the um, biopesticides can be used with the conventional or non-organic products. I'm guessing that most of you, I hope, are familiar with resistance, where some of our conventional products have been used over and over and over and then that the target pest has um, built up generations of a population that is able to withstand that particular pesticide spray. And so it's great to be able to kind of mix in other products like the biopesticides to help reduce that resistance. So they can be rotated with conventional products. They can even be mixed with some conventional products. And um, there's low risk of resistance with these products. So the downside though, with these is that they can be more expensive. Um, we kind of talked about the whole time it can take to develop the products. They might not be quite as effective. Um, you know, when we spray a conventional product, a lot of times they work in a few hours and we know it's gonna work on the eggs or the adult of an insect and kill it pretty quickly. Whereas that would probably be the case with the biopesticide. So they may not work immediately. They can have a shorter shelf life. They may need to be refrigerated. Also, they may need to be handled differently. And you just do need that more technical knowledge where you would really want to read the label. You know, we always stress reading the label, but with the biopesticide, you want to do that um, even more thoroughly. All right, so now I wanted to talk about the examples. So a few examples of insecticides, and then like I said, some fungicides. And I've already talked about what, you know, constitutes a biopesticide. It can be microbial, bacteria, fungi, virus, protozoa, or biochemical, plant extract, fatty acid, pheromones. So, um, with the insecticide examples, I just thought of this just now. So one that I'm not gonna uh, talk about targets grasshoppers. And grasshoppers is on everybody's mind now, but I'm not talking about it because it's not available. And I wanted to ask you guys, if you're still you know, listening, to put in chat of the microbials, what do you think I'm thinking of? the particular biopesticide that targets grasshoppers? Is it a bacteria, a fungi, a virus, or protozoa? Yeah, awesome. We have someone in chat that put the name of the product. Oh, we have a, a mix, a little bit of a mix. I just thought of it because, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure Nick is, but we're getting tons of uh, grasshopper questions. Um, so it is a protozoa and um, I don't have it in this topic because the product is not available, unfortunately, but someone in the chat said semaspore, which is the name of uh, one of the options. And the other one is no low bait, but that's a biopesticide protozoa and hopefully it will be available next year. But anyway, um, you don't need to read what's on here. This is just kind of give you an idea of, wow, there's a lot of different products out there that are considered bioinsecticides. And a lot, most of them are these biochemical um, products, but then the microbials. And you can see the microbials, the ingredient name is written in italics, and that's the scientific name of the organism that's in the product. 
So look at a few examples. Okay, so one insecticide that is based off a plant. And again, it's another one that I'm sure you guys are familiar with, neem. So most people know neem oil. And what I wanted to mention here is as a diractin. So as a diractin is also from the neem tree, um, but it's an extract from the seeds themselves. So it's not the, the same as neem oil, but it kind of works the same. Um, it's considered an insect growth regulator. So what that means is that it prevents an insect from molting to the next stage. You know, insects need to grow from a young nymph to an adult and they molt. So it prevents that molting from young to adult. So as a result, it's only effective on the younger life stages of these insects that I'll show you in a sec. But it does take some time, three to seven days. So it's not immediate, but it, it really is a great um, product. The only thing is that I think there might be if mostly um, residential people on the Zoom. I'm not sure. I'm just guessing. But most of the products that have as a diractin are for commercial production. So they're sold in larger quantities in higher concentrations. But the one in the middle, um, safer bioneme, is one that used to be available and you could look for it um, to see if it is, but it's for a backyard application. But these are the type of insects that as a diractin would target. And it's pretty, pretty big, wide mix of insects. And you know, this is being recorded so you guys can go back and, uh, and look at the specific insects for each product. So there's not enough time to cover all of them. All right, so the next is a bacteria-based insecticide. And the one I wanted to focus on, the bacteria name is Bacillus. So this is one that, again, I imagine that many of you might be familiar with. Um, so Bacillus is a large group of bacteria. There's a lot of different species. And they're interesting because they can survive in these crazy conditions like salt water, um, different temperatures of soil, hot, hot springs even, high pH, low pH. Um, and they're also able to form what are called resting spores, like a dormant stage, which makes it easy to um, produce for sale, easy to store. You don't have to store in a fridge or anything like that. And they last, last a pretty long time. And these bacillus can kill in various ways, like a stomach poison against the insect um, competition, or they may induce resistance. So there's over a hundred um, bacillus-based biopesticides that are registered. So the most common species is bacillus thuringiensis. And, um, most people just call it BT. So now if you hear BT, you know what it is. It's uh, the bacteria. Um, but now it's become so um, kind of specific that there are different strains of BT. So there's two strains, Kerstaki and Aizawi, that are specific to caterpillars and some beetle larvae. Um, and so you, you don't necessarily need to look for those two strains. Um, sometimes even the Aizawi is better on certain beetles and then Kerstaki is better on caterpillars, but the label will say. Um, and this list here is uh, a list of different product names and the ones underlined would be options for backyard application. And then if you're curious about um, Mosquito control, then there's BT Israeli, Israelensis for that. So that's the strain specific to flies and mosquitoes. And a lot of the mosquito abatement um, activities by the conservation districts will use this BT. So it's very specific, a lot safer than some of the other um, just broad spectrum insecticides that might be used. So the important thing about Bacillus thuringiensis or BT is that it has to be ingested by the target pest. 
So as a result, it works a lot better when the insects are young and they're really feeding actively and heavily. So you can see that by this video, the, bee, the bacteria release these toxins in the gut of the insect. And it starts to degrade the gut lining um, and then the toxins get released within the whole body of the insect and then it dies. All right, so example of uh, insecticide made from fungi. So the fungal-based insecticides contain um, living spores of fungi. So they're not dead, they're actually living in the product that you might have on the shelf. And how it works is it's sprayed on the plant, but it needs to come into contact with the particular insect. And if it does, then the spores that land on the insect surface penetrate into the insect and then the, the uh, hyphae of the fun fungus grows within the insect. And then it sporulates on the insect body and releases those spores and spreads it further. So here's an example, um, one of our nemesis, the um, black vine weevil that has been killed by a fungus and it's sporulating on the body of the insect itself. So here you can see it's on these wire worms as well. So that's kind of the plus side of the fungal-based insecticide is that the insects that are killed will then release more spores to kill other insects. Um, the most common example of a fungal-based insecticide is botanagard, and this could be used for uh, home or commercial use and specifically targets these soft-bodied insects like aphids and mealybugs, thrips, et cetera. See, there's another, another example is just for commercial use. It's MET52 and it's made of a fungus called metarhizum. Um, and the botanagard is made from a fungus called Bavaria. So I will say the downside for fungal insecticides is that you know, they really need to be used in more of a humid, a little bit wet environment. So using it on, um, say, grasshoppers, you know, is probably not going to be effective because they just become a little bit more active when conditions are more dry. And so you won't get that spread um, of the fungal spores. So high tunnels, greenhouses, indoor applications might be a little more effective. All right, a virus-based insecticide. There's everything out there. So um, the virus-based insecticides are highly effective. Um, they have a long shelf life, longer than some of the other products, several years. They're easy to apply um, and they target a single species. And once an insect is killed by the virus insecticide, the uh, virus will release and spread to others, just like I mentioned with the fun fungal-based insecticide. The downside is that these are more expensive. Um, they only target a single species. Um, also, there's not a lot of these available now. Um, in fact, for the vegetable pests, there's just one for corn earworm, but for fruit pests, there's one for codling moth. And then we don't have this problem in Utah, but spongy moth, which used to be called um, gypsy moth, is the third one. So those are the three that are commonly available. Um, but as I said, it's it works by, um, well, the product is sold as the virus are in these what are called occlusion bodies, which makes it shelf stable. And the virus particles are released from those occlusion bodies, killing the insects, shown on the right, and then when the insect dies, as I mentioned, those occlusion bodies are released to infect more insects. All right, so the final one um, targeting insects is made from spider venom. So this is a um, funnel web spider. It's big. It's not one that you want to come into contact with. And you won't because it's not in Utah. It occurs in um, Australia, but it's one that has been studied 
from, whoops, let me back up a bit, from the venom that is released. So you can see the fangs right here on this spider and the little bitty drop of venom shown at the tip of those fangs is what has been studied extensively by scientists. Like, can this be used to kill um, or to be used as an insecticide? Because it can actually kill humans. <laughs> so you don't wanna come into contact with that one. Um, so it's a Blue Mountains funnel web spider and the venom is laced with a toxin um, called versutoxin and it's a type of peptide. And um, so scientists have studied that venom and have figured out a way to create that peptide in the lab without having to constantly collect venom from a bunch of spiders. Um, and so they have taken that peptide and created two um, products that are available to purchase. Now I will say these are commercial products though. Um, it would be nice if they would do more for, for residential application but um, the company name is Vesteron. And when they released these products, they ac it actually made a brand new uh, mode of action of all the different products that are available on the market today. So, which is very big. A brand new mode of action means, okay, there's another product that can be used um, without you know, resistance. So it works by disrupting the nervous system of the insects it can last for two years on the shelf. It doesn't need to be refrigerated. And like others, it can be mixed with um, different products. So as I mentioned, it's for commercial application. Um, they really wanted to focus on these different sites like nursery, greenhouse, forest application, fruits and nuts. So you can see vegetables is not on the list, but I know that it will be coming soon. Um, so there's two products. The Spear Lep is for caterpillars and beetles, and it's mixed with that BT to give um, an even greater amount of efficacy. And then the Spear T targets those soft-bodied insects like the aphids and the mites and the thrips, et cetera. So that is definitely a novel product there. All right, so fungicides. Again, we got microbial and biochemical for this group as well. And it's a long list too. Um, uh, almost as many products as there are as for bioinsecticides. So you don't need to look at these, just know, okay, okay this is a pretty long list here. Um, so let's go over a few. All right, so fungal-based fungicides. Um, the most common is trichoderma. It has been uh, studied for decades and decades, and it's actually in a lot of different products like um, root enhancing growth products, stimulant products, um, but it's also used as a fungicide. So in this picture on the right, the fungus on the top is the trichoderma, and on the bottom is a plant pathogen. So it's working to prevent the growth of that fungus on the bottom. And it can work by competition, it can consume other fungi, and it can release toxins. So a couple of examples of fungicides that contain trichoderma are tenant and Optago. And the specifically, trichoderma targets soil-borne pathogens. So what I mean by that are pathogens that occur in the soil and infect the plant through the soil. So um, on our vegetable crops, it could be Fusarium, Phytophthora, Verticillium, Pythium. And it's applied as a soil drench to prevent infection. So there have been cases where Verticillium may occur in the field, but you wanna keep growing that particular crop, then you could use this trichoderma fungicide as a drench um, to prevent infection. All right, so a fungicide made from bacteria. And we'll go back to the bacillus, which we've already talked about. Uh, I mentioned there's over a hundred bacillus um, products out there. So some of those are fungicides as well. 
And so I'll show three examples here. So double nickel is just a foliar spray and that's gonna target um, some of the bacterial diseases that may affect vegetables and powdery mildew. Sonata is another uh, bacillus species and that targets specifically powdery mildew. And then finally, Serenade. And I've underlined Serenade because that is one that could be used for uh, residential use as well. That one, powdery mildew, um, you know, you guys I'm sure have experienced powdery mildew on melons pretty bad um, and some on some other plants too. So if you're looking for an organic option, then Serenade could be one that might work for you. Okay, so still on fungicides um, and an example of one that's made from a plant. So the product name is Regalia, and this is made from an extract of the giant knotweed plant. And it was just found, um, I mean, I, I can't imagine actually studying all these things, like the plant, the extracts, whatever. So anyway, they found that um, it can actually help when it's applied to a plant, it can help induce resistance within that plant. So it um, just signals the plant to maybe have stronger cell wall, or maybe it signals the plant to release um, uh, antimicrobials, other defense mechanisms that would target or prevent certain pathogens like powdery mildew, uh, some blights, anthracnose bacteria, so regalia has been shown to be pretty effective on some of these particular pests. All right, so finally, the last example is a fungicide that's made from a virus, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so a um, virus that attacks a plant pathogen, specifically bacteria, are called phages, a bacteriophage. And it, um, I'll show this video here. This video is actually not actual bacteria and virus particles. It's a kind of a graphic that was created to give an idea of how it works. So these little um, pink things are supposed to be the bacterial cells. And then this little kind of rocket ship looking thing is a phage or a bacteriophage virus. So it lands on the bacteria and then it injects its virus particles or its DNA into the bacteria, hijacks that bacterial cell, forces the bacteria to make multiple phages, and then those phages are released to go after more bacteria. So not only does it kill the bacteria itself, but then it, it targets other bacteria within the area. So then you have lots of phages. So it's that compounded application. And um, the company that makes this product, Agrifog, is actually from Utah. So it's a nice little plug, Sandy, Utah. It's The name is Agrifog. And they make um, uh, an agrifage for fire blight. They make an agrifage for diseases of tomato, onion, um, and then they also make one for, if you've heard of, if you drink orange juice, you may have heard of citrus canker. Um, and so these are, again, are, you know, a novel way of trying to manage these specific pests that um, really have not been treated as well with some of the conventional products. So with that, I'll summarize and say that um, the biofungicides for the most part, they're used preventively. They really work best before pest populations are high. Um, they're not systemic. So they don't flow through the whole plant itself. Some of the products need to come into contact with the pest. They may take longer to kill the pest. They may have a shorter shelf life and they may need to be stored a certain way. So, um, oh, a little bit more. Um, they really do help in reducing the issue with uh, resistance and reliance on some of the conventional pesticides. And of course, there's that positive public benefit.
So oh, I don't have my contact info here on this last slide, but I can, if needed, I can put it in chat. But I think I'll end it there, Nick, in case anyone has might have any questions. I know that was a little bit technical, but um, again, good to know what you might be using.